biological pest control, which is all about beating the bugs, the slugs and the grubs. I'm speaking on the basis of our own experience at Fletching Glass Houses where we grow organic vegetables. We also grow pot plants for gifts as well, but the main place where we use the biological controls is in the glass houses. So if you think about it, all the energy on the planet comes from the sun and we just can't use that energy unless we have plants to turn it into food. But of course there are other creatures on this earth who also can't use the energy unless they eat plants. So it's not really surprising that there are other creatures that when we provide, uh, when we grow plants for our enjoyment or whether we grow plants for our food, when we put them out, other creatures come along and eat them. It's, it's just not surprising. We shouldn't really maybe think of them as much as pests, as, as competitors. It's part of the natural world. So that's just a bit of philosophy. And now let's move on to how we control the pests and how we, um, how we stop them using up all our plants before we've enjoyed them. So there are four definite types of control for pests. The first one is chemical control. Chemical control means using um, a, a, a chemical and artificial substance to poison the pest. And the downside of that is that it, it can get right into the plant, go right through the ecosystem and have surprising results on other creatures. The second, we don't use that at uh, Fletcher and Glass Houses because we're organically certified, so we only use biological controls. Um, if we want to kill insects with a pesticide, we use a biological pesticide, uh, something like soap, which has a physical action and it doesn't get into the plant and spread through the ecosystem. The second method is cultural control, which is a really useful way of controlling pests, and that is just to find out where, what they like and try and avoid it. So, um, straightforward uh, example is we get tomato blight every year at our glass houses and we try and avoid it by growing early tomatoes, bush tomatoes, so that we escape that little window. And there are all sorts of other examples of just getting around the situation. The third method is physical control and that would mean like putting uh, nets over carrots to avoid carrot fly and um, it would involve putting up sticky traps to catch insects and all those physical methods. But the one we're going to talk about this morning is biological control and that means finding the natural enemies of uh, these pests and introducing them and they can do the work. And I've got five examples that I um, want to go through this morning. Um, I'm going to talk about nematodes, mites, parasitic wasps, um, mealybug predators, and then lacewings and ladybirds. So let's start off with the first example, which is nematodes. Now, nematodes are actually one of the most abundant creatures in the soil, and there are all sorts of different nematodes. They're part of the, suits, the whole soil life, and the soil wouldn't be alive without them. It, they're essential. Um, but there are good nematodes and there are bad nematodes, so people find that confusing. So the sort of nematodes that eat your potatoes are sort of like the bad nematodes, and the sort of um, nematodes that eat the slugs are the good nematodes. It's just a question of um, whether they're on your side or not. And nematodes are bred in this country and um, packaged out. You can buy them as a little paste. Different nematodes attack different um, creatures. So there's, you can see examples there. There's chafer bug and leather jackets which attack your lawns. There are nematodes that, for those. Then there are nematodes for slugs. There are nematodes for vine weevil. And then there's mixes of nematodes for caterpillars and so on. So there's all sorts of different ones. It's not just you buy a pack of nematodes. You have to know which one you want. Now, when they come, they're alive. So on the next slide is an example where I put the nematode paste that we just bought under a microscope. And if you look really carefully, you can see that they're moving. So that's what they look at like at 1 to 200, and that's just putting a microscope on that paste that you see being passed around. 
And how do they work? Well, they seek out their prey in the soil by detecting the waste matter from their prey, the slug trails and, and whatever. And when they find their prey, the slug, for example, then they get inside it through their ears or all sorts of other holes in their body. And, and then they dissolve the slug from the inside. And, and then they use the dissolved parts to, as a nursery to breed more nematodes and so on. So that's how they work. And on the left, you can see um, it, the slug has got a great big swelling, which shows it's been infected. It's it, actually interesting enough, it's not the, ne the nematodes actually bring bacteria in to the slug to dissolve it from the inside. So there's another uh, living organism involved in, that, in the whole process. So um, once you introduce them, they'll carry on reproducing um, and they'll carry on until they run out of slugs or they don't like the conditions and then they'll die out again and then you have to introduce them again. So you have to just be aware of, we of, 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 of when your um, plants are getting damaged and make sure that you treat them in time. Um, on the next slide, I think I've got an example of what happened to us when we weren't on the case. And this is our pak choy in our glass houses, and that's what it looks like when the slugs go rampant. And that can be, in our case, it could be January and February, but if you were outside, it'd be March, April. So you've just got to be on the watch. So moving on from nematodes, I want to talk about plant mites. Now, uh, there's an, a list there of mites that... Um, you might have heard of, strawberry mites, bowl mite and so on. All sorts of different mites will attack plants. Mites are tiny, tiny little spiders, if you like to think of them like that, that um, have adapted themselves to live off plant cells. So they will go and suck the sap out of individual cells and quite often the first sign you might see is a bit of stickiness ar around the leaf and that means that some insect is puncturing the individual cells. And you might be lucky though not to have encountered mites. Um, so here I've got an example of strawberry mite and um, on the previous slide you saw them with that when they were just at starting to attack and this is what happens when they go rampant. Um, two points here. One is that the first sign, before you get to the cobweb stage, the first sign of spider mite is actually the unique pattern they leave on the leaves by puncturing the individual cells. And that pattern is different on beans or aubergines. And you soon, when you know your own plants, uh, if you see, see it on the weeds, say, you'll know, ah, it's coming, spider mite is coming. Um, funny enough, spider mite is called red spider mite when it doesn't look like a red spider and it's hardly ever red. So it's quite a confusing name and preferably we call it the two-spotted mite because it, over the course of the season it slowly creates two black spots. This is the um, up 1 to 400, um, uh, a video I took of a uh, young spider mite and you can see him or her. They, they tend to change sex, but quite a lot of them are females, apparently. And then later on in the season, you can see that um, they accumulate waste either side of their body, so they um, are then much more easily identified as the two-spotted mite, or glasshouse mite. They move quite fast, and you can um, identify them under the microscope by the way that they move and when you s I've got another video later of the predator and you can see it moves in a different way so here he is looking for something to eat or maybe he's just scared of the microscope I'm not sure but <laughs> and then finally here's an older one and this these are just amateur videos, so you'll see it sort of whizzing out the side and coming back in. It was the best I could do. OK, and um, so we tackle spider mites with these predators here. This is going back to 1 to 200 again. And this is um, a video of how the um, predator arrives. And you can see that the predator moves in a completely different way and he looks completely different. It's like comparing 
um, I don't know, a lion with a goat, they move in different ways because one's a carnivore and the other one's a herbivore. And so it's the same. You can see these predators are easily distinguished from the, mite, from the spider mite by the way that they move. And you buy them in a little tube and then let them out and one, uh, one set of mites has a war with the others and it's a question of who breeds the fastest as to who wins. So they're widely used commercially and that uh, mite is called Phytocelius persimilis. But um, there are other mites and um, you can buy mites in sachets. Al, can you just... So you can buy mites in sachets and just hang them up and then they'll crawl out the hole at the back end and eat the spider mite that way. It's a good preventative measure. But we've now got a slide on um, to do with something different, which is white fly. You can see the female white fly um, at one to two hundred moving around and, and laying eggs. And the one thing that you can distinguish white fly by is that when you turn over a cabbage leaf or anything, you see little horseshoes of white. And under the microscope, you can see those are eggs. Um, the other way you recognise white fly is that the, um, when you touch the leaf of your cabbage or whatever it is, the little, little white things that look like miniature moths fly around. A lot of people get muddled up between white fly and aphids because aphid skins are white and they think that they've got white fly when they've got aphids. But in fact, um, the best way of distinguishing white fly is just to touch the leaf and if it if you get clouds of little white, then that's white fly. It's not only us in our glass houses to get them, you can get them outside as well. And the way to attack those commercially is with a parasitic wasp. Now you might think, oh, I don't want any wasps near me, but it's only called a wasp because it belongs to the whole family, Hymenoptera, I think they are, of bees and wasps creatures that have adapted themselves to sting. They either sting to attack or sting to defend. But that's the only thing that this parasitic wasp has in common with the one that the, the white, the yellow and black striped ones, which you don't like. Uh, it won't sting you, it stings the um, white fly and so parasitizes them and, um, and then breeds in that way. In Carsia formosa is this Chappie's name and we buy him as eggs on cards so that's on our broccoli and you can see there's a little card and with little black up here little black band on and that's eggs which hatch out and fly as it's close up a bit and then they fly as little tiny tiny wasps they don't look like wasps at all and then they attack the white fly and that is a, a very uh, common cheap commercial way of controlling white fly it doesn't ha it doesn't work on every single white fly i have found with the experience but it it's a really good one to start with oh sorry that's the that's the little parasitic wasp at one to two hundred having just um got out of its egg now mealybug um so it just looks like cotton wool but when you look at the cotton wool under the microscope again, um, I think that's at 1 to 200, you can see mealybug. And I distinguish them particularly by their long tails. They're quite, um, that's quite a good way of um, distinguishing them. They're very common um, in pot plants, orchids, bougainvillea, um, jasmine, olives. They love all those things. And when you if you don't know you might just think oh well that's a bit of cotton wool no problem at all but you don't realize that underneath that they're breeding the cotton wool is in fact their eggs so to combat those we um you can bring in predators which are actually going to hatch out into ladybirds but when they're young they they kind of camouflage themselves to look a bit like mealybug so that they can get among them and um, eat them up. And this is the Australian ladybird larvae. They're bred for us in Kent by um, Y bugs who are on the Y College campus. And they arrive um, by first class post in a little tube, you let them out on your orchids or whatever it is, and then they eat up the mealybug for you. Um, 
trying to be practical, it would only be worth your while if you had a, a problem on some um, expensive plants or crops because they are going to cost you something like, I don't know, 20 pounds to um, bring them in in the tube. So um, if you can't uh, afford that, then just wash the plant down with hot water and soap and do it again and again until all the mealy bugs are gone. So finally, um, the final example is aphids, which I'm sure you'll have seen in different forms. There are green fly, as we call them on roses. There are black fly, as we call them on beans. And then there are aphids that you get on peppers, which are kind of peach potato aphid. And then there are um, aphids that you get on citrus flowers. So there are all sorts of different aphids. Um, and here's an example of one at um, one to 200 that I captured on a leaf moving around. And aphids can be tackled commercially with um, parasites quite cheaply. There's um, one called um, Aphidius colmani, which is um, a, a parasite which will um, eliminate all the normal-sized uh, normal aphids, the sort that you get on... Um, peppers and so on, but it, the larger aphids it won't touch, they won't touch black fly or green fly. Here's just one more example of, of the larger of the aphids. So those ones wouldn't be um, targeted by the cheap remedy. And here he is close up, so this one is uh, 1 to 400 under a microscope, and you can see the typical two tubes or breathing tubes at the bottom of his body and that is the way that you can distinguish aphids apart from the way that they move which is pretty obvious when you get used to it so they just move in a different way from mites or white fly or anything and just a word about ladybirds. People like the idea of introducing ladybirds because they're pretty and everybody knows that they're native and um, it's a nice idea and people sell ladybird houses and so on. Um, you can buy them. I don't think they're terribly practical um, to eliminate an aphid uh, attack, but they will be introducing more ladybirds into the wild, so they're a good thing anyway. And then moving on to lace wings. Lace wings are slightly more cost effective. They are beautiful uh, lacy winged insects and their larvae again will eat big aphids as well as small aphids. Um, they're, again they're not cheap but it's you're doing something good introducing uh, them into the environment and they will have some effect on your um, aphid problems as long as you don't leave it too late. So, that's ladybirds and lace wings. And so, um, I always like this little rhyme. Uh, so, in summary, biological controls is all about finding the natural enemies of your pests and introducing them in a, in a safe and practical way to defend your plants. Um, they, they, we use the term control rather than killers or anything like that because we're trying to get the population of the pest back into balance. We're not ever expecting to eradicate everything. We're just trying to get a balance back. So you always have to accept that you might have to introduce the same predator again the next year or the next season. It's not a, I'm going to eradicate aphids from the face of the earth kind of situation. It's, going to, it's just simply get the thing back into control. Um, quite a lot of organic growers have a little kind of um, measure in their mind how much attack they will accept on their, uh, on their vegetables and, or whatever they're growing. And we reckon, you know, once it gets beyond 5% or 10% of, of your leaves being spoilt or whatever it is, then we would go in and really try and hammer the pest. But a certain amount of slugs and whatever around, we accept. 